Chapter 19 of The Romance of Modern Invention This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alistair Braid, Glasgow, Scotland. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams. Chapter 19. Mechanical Flight. Few, if any, problems have so strongly influenced the imagination and exercised the ingenuity of mankind as that of aerial navigation. There is something in our nature that rebels against being condemned to the condition of featherless bipeds when birds, bats and even minute insects have the whole realm of air and the wide heavens open to them. Who has not, like Solomon, pondered upon the way of a bird in the air, with feelings of envy and regret that he is chained to earth by his gross body, contrasting our laboured movements from point to point of the earth's surface with the easy gliding of the feathered traveller. The unrealised wish has found expression in legends of Daedalus, Pegasus in the flying carpet of the fairy tale, and in the pages of Jules Verne, in which last the adventurous rover on his clipper of the clouds anticipates the future in a most startling fashion. Aeromobilism, to use its modern title, is regarded by the crowd as the mechanical counterpart of the philosopher's stone, or the elixir of life, a highly desirable but unattainable thing. At times, this incredulity is transformed by highly coloured press reports into an equally unreasonable readiness to believe that the conquest of the air is completed, followed by a feeling of irritation that facts are not as they were represented in print. The proper attitude is, of course, halfway between these extremes. Reflection will show us that money, time, and life itself would not have been freely and ungrudgingly given or risked by many men, hard-headed, practical men among them, in pursuit of a will-o'-the-wisp, especially in a century when scientific calculation tends always to calm down any too imaginative scheme. The existing state of the aerial problem may be compared to that of a railway truck, which an insufficient number of men are trying to move. Ten men may make no impression on it, though they are putting out all their strength. Yet the arrival of an eleventh may enable them to overcome the truck's inertia and move it at an increasing pace. Every new discovery of the scientific application of power brings us nearer to the day when the truck will move. We have metals of wonderful strength in proportion to their weight. Pygmy motors containing the force of giants, a huge fund of mechanical experience to draw upon. In fact, to paraphrase the jingle song, we've got the things, we've got the men, we've got the money too. But we haven't, as yet, got the machine that can mock the bird like the flying express mocks the strength and speed of horses. The reason of this is not far to seek. The difficulties attending the creation of a successful flying machine are immense, some unique, not being found in aquatic and terrestrial locomotion. In the first place, the airship, flying machine, aerostat, or whatever we please to call it, must not merely move, but also lift itself. Neither a ship nor a locomotive is called upon to do this. Its ability to lift itself must depend upon the employment of large balloons or upon sheer power. In the first case, the balloon will, by reason of its size, be unmanageable in a high wind. In the second case, a breakdown in the machinery would probably prove fatal. Even supposing that our aerostat can lift itself successfully, we encounter the difficulties connected with steering in a medium traversed by ever-shifting currents of air, which demands of the helmsman a caution and capacity seldom required on land or water. Add to these the difficulties of leaving the ground and alighting safely upon it, and, what is more serious than all, the fact that, though success can be attained only by experiment, Experiment is, in this case, extremely expensive and risky, any failure often resulting in total ruin of the machine and sometimes in loss of life. The list of those who have perished in the search for the power of flight is a very long one. Yet, in spite of these obstacles, determined attempts have been and are being made to conquer the air. Men in a position to judge are confident that the day of conquest is not very far distant and that the next generation may be as familiar with aerostats as we with motor cars. 
Speculation as to the future is, however, here less profitable than a consideration of what has already been done in the direction of collecting forces for the final victory. To begin at the beginning, we see that experimenters must be divided into two great classes. Those who pin their faith to airships lighter than air, e.g. Santos Dumont, Zeppelin, Rose, and those who have small respect for balloons and see the ideal aircraft in a machine lifted entirely by means of power and surfaces pressing the air after the manner of a kite. Sir Hiram Maxim and Professor S. P. Langley, Mr. Lawrence Hargrave and Mr. Sidney Hollins are eminent members of the latter cult. As soon as we get on the topic of steerable balloons, the name of Mr. Santos Dumont looms large. But before dealing with his exploits, we may notice the airship of Count Zeppelin, an ingenious and costly structure that was tested over Lake Constance in 1900. The balloon was built in a large wooden shed, 450 by 78 by 66 feet, that floated on the lake on 90 pontoons. The shed alone cost over £10,000. The balloon itself was nearly 400 feet long, with a cylindrical diameter of 39 feet, except at its ends, which were conical, to offer as little resistance as possible to the air. Externally, it afforded the appearance of a single compartment bag, but in reality it was divided into 17 parts, each gas tight, so that an accident to one part of the fabric should not imperil the whole. A framework of aluminium rods and rings gave the bag a partial rigidity. Its capacity was 12,000 cubic yards of hydrogen gas, which, as our readers doubtless know, is much lighter, though more expensive, than ordinary coal gas, each inflation costing several hundreds of pounds. Under the balloon hung two cars of aluminium, the motors and the screws, and also a great sliding weight of 600 pounds for altering the tip of the airship and rudders to steer its course. On June the 30th, a great number of scientific men and experts assembled to witness the behaviour of a balloon which had cost £20,000. For two days, wind prevented a start, but on July the 2nd, at 17.30pm, the balloon emerged from its shed and at 8 o'clock commenced its first journey, with and against a light easterly wind for a distance of three and a half miles. A mishap to the steering gear occurred early in the trip and prevented the airship appearing to advantage, but a landing was effected easily and safely. In the following October, the Count made a second attempt, returning a wind blowing at three yards a second, or rather more than six miles an hour. Owing to lack of funds, the fate of the Great Eastern has overtaken the Zeppelin airship, to be broken up and the parts sold. The aged Count had demonstrated that a petroleum motor could be used in the neighbourhood of gas without danger. It was, however, reserved for a younger man to give a more decided proof of the steerableness of a balloon. In 1900, Monsieur Henri Deutsch, a member of the French Aero Club, founded a prize of £4,000, to win which a competitor must start from the Aero Club Park near the Seine in Paris, sail to and round the Eiffel Tower, and be back at the starting point within a time limit of half an hour. Monsieur Santos Dumont, a wealthy and plucky young Brazilian had, previously to this offer, made several successful journeys in motor balloons in the neighbourhood of the Eiffel Tower. He therefore determined to make a bid for the prize with a specially constructed balloon, Santos Dumont V. The third unsuccessful attempt ended in disaster to the airship, which fell onto the houses, but fortunately without injuring its occupant. Another balloon, Santos Dumont VI, was then built, on Saturday, October the 19th, Monsieur Dumont reached the tower in nine minutes and recrossed the starting line in twenty and a half more minutes, thus complying with the conditions of the prize with half a minute to spare. A dispute, however, arose as to whether the prize had been actually won, some of the committee contending that the balloon should have come to earth within the half hour, instead of merely passing overhead. But finally, the well-merited prize was awarded to the determined young aeronaut. The successful airship was of moderate proportions as compared with that of Count Zeppelin. The cigar-shaped bag was 112 feet long and 20 feet in diameter, holding 715 cubic yards of gas. Monsieur Dumont showed originality in furnishing it with a smaller balloon inside, 
which could be pumped full of air so as to counteract any leakage in the external bag and keep it taut. The motor, on which everything depended, was a four-cylinder petrol-driven engine furnished with water jackets to prevent overheating. The motor turned a large screw made of silk and stretched over light frames 200 times a minute, giving a driving force of 175 pounds. Behind, a rudder directed the airship, and in front hung down a long rope suspended by one end that could be drawn towards the centre of the frame to alter the trim of the ship. The aeronaut stood in a large wicker basket, flanked on either side by bags of sand ballast. The fact that the motor, once stopped, could only be restarted by coming to earth again added an element of great uncertainty to all his trips, and on one occasion the misfiring of one of the cylinders almost brought about a collision with the Eiffel Tower. From Paris, Monsieur Dumont went to Monaco at the invitation of the prince of that principality, and cruised about over the bay in his balloon. His fresh scheme was to cross to Corsica, but it was brought to an abrupt conclusion by a leakage of gas, which precipitated balloon and balloonist into the sea. Dumont was rescued, and at once set about new projects, including a visit to the Crystal Palace, where he would have made a series of ascents this summer, 1902, but for damage done to the silk of the gas bag by its immersion in salt water and the other vicissitudes it had passed through. Dumont's most important achievement has been, like that of Count Zeppelin, the application of the gasoline motor to aeromobilism. In proportion to its size, this form of motor develops a large amount of energy, and its mechanism is comparatively simple, a matter of great moment to the aeronaut. He has also shown that under favourable conditions, a balloon may be steered against a headwind, though not with the certainty that is desirable before air travel can be pronounced an even moderately simple undertaking. The fact that many inventors, such as Dr Barton, Monsieur Rose, Henri Deutsch, are fitting motors to balloons in the hopes of solving the aerial problem shows that the airship has still a strong hold on the minds of men. But on reviewing the successes of such combinations of lifting and driving power, it must be confessed, with all due respect to Mr Dumont, that they are somewhat meagre and do not show any great advance. The question is whether these men are not working on wrong lines and whether their utmost endeavours and those of their successors will ever produce anything more than a very semi-successful craft. Their efforts appear foredoomed to failure. As Sir Hiram Maxim has observed, a balloon by its very nature is light and fragile. It is a mere bubble. If it were possible to construct a motor to develop 100 horsepower for every pound of its weight, it would still be impossible to navigate a balloon against a wind of more than a certain strength. The mere energy of the motor would crush the gas bag against the pressure of the wind, deform it, and render it unmanageable. Balloons, therefore, must be at the mercy of the wind, and obliged to submit to it under conditions not always in accordance with the wish of the aeronaut. Sir Hiram, in condemning the airship, was ready with a substitute. On looking round on the patterns of nature, he concluded that, inasmuch as all things that fly are heavier than air, the problem of aerial navigation must be solved by a machine whose natural tendency is to fall to the ground, and which can be sustained only by the exertion of great force. Its very weight would enable it to withstand, at least to a far greater extent than the airship, the varying currents of the air. The lifting principle must be analogous to that by which a kite is suspended. A kite is prevented from rising beyond a certain height by a string, and the pressure of the wind working against it at an angle tends to lift it, like a soft wedge continuously driven under it. In practice, it makes no difference whether the kite be stationary in a wind or towed rapidly through a dead cam. The wedge-like action of the air remains the same. Maxim decided upon constructing what was practically a huge compound kite driven by very powerful motors. But before setting to work on the machine itself, he made some useful experiments to determine the necessary size of his kites or aeroplanes and the force requisite to move them. He accordingly built a whirling table consisting of a long arm mounted on a strong pivot at one end and driven by a 10 horsepower engine. To the free end, which described a circle of 200 feet in circumference, he attached small aeroplanes and by means of delicate balances discovered that at 40 miles an hour the aeroplane would lift 133 pounds per horsepower and at 60 miles per hour every square foot of surface sustained eight pounds weight. 
he, in common with other experimenters on the same lines, became aware of the fact that if it took a certain strain to suspend a stationary weight in the air, to advance it rapidly as well as to suspend it took a smaller strain. Now, as on sea and land, increased speed means a very rapid increase in the force required. This is a point in favour of the flying machine. Professor Langley found that a brass plate weighing a pound, when whirled at great speed, was supported in the air by a pulling pressure of less than one ounce. And, of course, as the speed increased, the plate became more nearly horizontal, offering less resistance to the air. It is on this behaviour of the aeroplane that the hopes of Maxim and others have been based. The swiftly moving aeroplane, coming constantly on to fresh air, the inertia of which had not been disturbed, would resemble the skater who can at high speed traverse ice that would not bear him at rest. Maxim next turned his attention to the construction of the aeroplanes and engines. He made a special machine for testing fabrics, to decide which would be the most suitable for stretching over strong frames to form the planes. The fabric must be light, very strong, and offer small frictional resistance to the air. The testing machine was fitted with a nozzle, through which air was forced at a known pace onto the substance under trial, which met the air current at a certain angle and by means of indicators showed the strength of its lift or tendency to rise and that of its drift or tendency to move horizontally in the direction of the air current. A piece of tin mounted at an angle of 1 in 10 to the air current showed a lift of 10 times its drift. This proportion was made the standard. Experiments conducted on velvet, plush, silk, cotton and woolen goods proved that the drift of crepe was several times that of its lift, but that fine linen had a lift equal to nine times its drift, while a sample of Spencer's balloon fabric was as good as tin. Accordingly, he selected this balloon fabric to stretch over light but strong frames. The stretching of the material was no easy matter, as uneven tension distorted it, but eventually the aeroplanes were completed, tight as drumheads. The larger central plane was 50 feet wide and 40 long. On either side were auxiliary planes, five pairs, giving a total of 5,400 square feet. The steam engine, built to give the motive power, was perhaps the most interesting feature of the whole construction. Maxim employed steam in preference to any other power as being one with which he was most familiar and yielding most force in proportion to the weight of the apparatus. He designed and constructed a pair of high-pressure compound engines, the high-pressure cylinders 5 inches in diameter, the low-pressure 8 inches, and both 1 foot stroke. Steam was supplied to the high-pressure cylinders at £320 per square inch from a tubular boiler heated by a gasoline burner so powerful in its action as to raise the pressure from 100 to £200 in a minute. The total weight of the boiler, burner and engines developing 350 horsepower was £2,000, or about £6 per horsepower. The two screw propellers driven by the engine measured 17 feet 11 inches in diameter. The completed flying machine, weighing 7,500 pounds, was mounted on a railway truck of 9 foot gauge in Baldwin's Park, Kent, not far from the gun factories for which Sir Hiram is famous. Outside and parallel to the nine-foot track was a second track, 35 feet across, with the reversed rail, so that as soon as the machine should rise from the inner track, long spars furnished with flanged wheels at their extremities should press against the underside of the outer track and prevent the machine from rising too far. Dynamometers, or instruments for measuring strains, were fitted to decide the driving and lifting power of the screws. Experiments proved that with the engines working at full power, the screw thrust against the air was 2,200 pounds and the lifting force of the aeroplanes 10,000 pounds or 1,500 in excess of the machine's weight. Everything being ready, the machine was fastened to a dynamometer and steam run up until it strained at its tether with maximum power. When the moorings were suddenly released and it bounded forward at a terrific pace, so suddenly that some of the crew were flung violently down onto the platform. When a speed of 42 miles was reached, the inner wheels left their track and the outer wheels came into play. Unfortunately, the 35-foot axle trees were too weak to bear the strain and one of them broke. The upper track gave way and for the first time in the history of the world, a flying machine actually left the ground fully equipped with engines, boiler, fuel and a crew. The journey, however, was a short one. 
where part of the broken track fouled the screws, snapped a propeller blade and necessitated the shutting off of the steam, which done, the machine settled to earth, the wheels sinking into the sward and showing by the absence of any marks that it had come directly downwards and not run along the surface. The inventor was prevented by other business and by the want of a sufficiently large open space from continuing his experiments, which had demonstrated that a large machine heavier than air could be made to lift itself and move at high speed. Misfortune alone prevented its true capacities being shown. Another experimenter on similar lines, but on a less heroic scale than Sir Hiram Maxim, is Professor S. P. Langley, the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Washington. For 16 years he has devoted himself to a persevering course of study of the flying machine, and after oft-repeated failures has scored a decided success in his aerodrome, which, though only a model, has made considerable flights. His researches have proved beyond doubt that the amount of energy required for flight is but one-fiftieth of what was formerly regarded as a minimum. A French mathematician had proved by figures that a swallow must develop the power of a horse to maintain its rapid flight. Professor Langley's aerodrome has told a very different tale, affording another instance of the truth of the saying that an ounce of practice is worth a pound of theory. A bird is nearly 1,000 times heavier than the air it displaces. As a motor, it develops huge power for its weight and consumes a very large amount of fuel in doing so. An observant naturalist has calculated that the homely robin devours per diem in proportion to its size what would be to a man a sausage 200 feet long and 3 inches thick. Anyone who has watched birds pulling worms out of the garden lawn and swallowing them wholesale can readily credit this. Professor Langley therefore concentrated himself on the production of an extremely light and at the same time powerful machine. Like Maxim, he turned to steam for motive power and by rigid economy of weight constructed an engine with boilers weighing 5 pounds, cylinders of 26 ounces and an energy of 1 to 1 and a half horsepower. Surely a masterpiece of mechanical workmanship. This he enclosed in a boat-shaped cover which hung from two pairs of aeroplanes 12 and a half feet from tip to tip. The whole apparatus weighed nearly 30 pounds of which one quarter represented the machinery. Experiments with smaller aerodromes warned the professor that rigidity and balance were the two most difficult things to attain, also that the starting of the machine on its aerial course was far from an easy matter. A soaring bird does not rise straight from the ground, but opens its wings and runs along the ground until the pressure of the air raises it sufficiently to give a full stroke of its pinions. Also, it rises against the wind to get the full benefit of its lifting force. Professor Langley hired a houseboat on the Potomac River and on the top of it built an apparatus from which the aerodrome could be launched into space at high velocity. On May the 6th, 1896, after a long wait for propitious weather, the aerodrome was dispatched on a trial trip. It rose in the face of the wind and travelled for over half a mile at the rate of 25 miles an hour. The water and fuel being then exhausted, it settled lightly on the water and was again launched. Its flight on both occasions was steady and limited only by the rapid consumption of its power producing elements. The professor believes that larger machines would remain in the air for a long period and travel at speeds hitherto unknown to us. In both the machines that we have considered, the propulsive power was a screw. No counterpart of it is seen in nature. This is not a valid argument against its employment, since no animal is furnished with driving wheels, nor does any fish carry a revolving propeller in its tail. But some inventors are strongly in favour of copying nature as regards the employment of wings. Mr Sidney H. Hollins, an enthusiastic aeromobilist, has devised an ingenious cylinder motor so arranged as to flap a pair of long wings, giving them a much stronger impulse on the down than on the upstroke. The pectoral muscles of a bird are reproduced by two strong springs, which are extended by the upward motion of the wings and store up energy for the downstroke. Close attention is also being paid to the actual shape of a bird's wing, which is not flat but hollow on its underside, and at the front has a slightly downward dip. 
Aero curves are therefore likely to supersede the aeroplane, for nature would not have built birds' wings as they are without an object. The theory of the aero curve's action is this, that the front of the wing, on striking the air, gives it a downward motion, and if the wing were quite flat, its rear portion would strike air already in motion, and therefore less buoyant. The curvature of a floating bird's wings, which becomes more and more pronounced towards the rear, counteracts this yielding of the air by pressing harder upon it as it passes towards their hinder edge. The aero curve has been used by a very interesting group of experimenters, those who, putting motors entirely aside, have floated on wings and learnt some of the secrets of balancing in the air. For a man to propel himself by flapping wings, moved by legs or arms, is impossible. Sir Hiram Maxim, in addressing the Aeronautical Society, once said that for a man to successfully imitate a bird, his lungs must weigh 40 pounds, to consume sufficient oxygen, his breast muscles 75 pounds, and his breastbone be extended in front 21 inches. And unless his total weight were increased, his legs must dwindle to the size of broomsticks, his head to that of an apple. So that, for the present, we shall be content to remain as we are. Dr Lilienthal, a German, was the first to try scientific wing sailing. He became a regular air gymnast, running down the sides of an artificial mound until the wings lifted him up and enabled him to float a considerable distance before reaching earth again. His wings had an area of 160 square feet, or about a foot to every pound weight. He was killed by the wings collapsing in mid-air. A similar fate also overtook Mr Percy Pilcher, who abandoned the initial run down a sloping surface in favour of being towed on a rope attached to a fast-moving vehicle. At present, Mr Octave Chanute of Chicago is the most distinguished member of the gliding school. He employs, instead of wings, a species of kite made up of a number of small aero curves placed one on top of the other, a small distance apart. These box kites are said to give a great lifting force for their weight. These and many other experimenters have had the same object in view, to learn the laws of equilibrium in the air. Until these are fully understood, the construction of large flying machines must be regarded as somewhat premature. Man must walk before he can run, and balance himself before he can fly. There is no falling off in the number of aerial machines and schemes brought from time to time into public notice. We may assure ourselves that if patient work and experiment can do it, the problem of how to fly is not very far from solution at the present moment. As a sign of the times, the War Office, not usually very ready to take up a new idea, has interested itself in the airship and commissioned Dr F. A. Barton to construct a dirigible balloon which combines the two systems of aerostation. Propulsion is effected by six sets of triple propellers, three on each side. Ascent is brought about partly by a balloon 180 feet long containing 156,000 cubic feet of hydrogen, partly by nine aeroplanes having a total superficial area of nearly 2,000 square feet. The utilisation of these aeroplanes obviates the necessity to throw out ballast to rise or to let out gas for a descent. The airship, being just heavier than air, is raised by the 135 horsepower motors pressing the aeroplanes against the air at the proper angle. In descent, they act as parachutes. The most original feature of this war balloon is the automatic water balance. At each end of the deck is a tank holding 40 gallons of water. Two pumps circulate water through these tanks, the amount sent into a tank being regulated by a heavy pendulum which turns on the cock leading to the end which may be highest in proportion as it turns off that leading to the lower end. The idea is very ingenious and should work successfully when the time of trial comes. Valuable money prizes will be competed for by aeronauts at the coming World's Fair at St Louis in 1903. Sir Hiram Maxim has expressed an intention of spending £20,000 in further experiments and prizes. In this country, too, certain journals have offered large rewards to any aeronaut who shall make prescribed journeys in a given time. It has also been suggested that aeronautical research should be endowed by the state 
since England has nothing to fear more than the flying machine and the submarine boat, each of which tends to rob her of the advantages of being an island by exposing her to unexpected and unseen attacks. Tennyson, in a fine passage in Locksley Hall, turns a poetical eye toward the future. This is what he sees. For I dipped into the future, far as human eye could see, saw the vision of the world and all the wonder that would be, saw the heavens fill with commerce, our gosses of magic sail, pilots of the purple twilight dropping down with costly bales, heard the heavens filled with shouting, then there rained a ghostly dew, from the nation's airy navies grappling in the central blue. Expressed in more prosaic language, the flying machine will primarily be used for military purposes. A country cannot spread a metal umbrella over itself to protect its towns from explosives dropped from the clouds. Mail services will be revolutionised. The pleasure aerodrome will take the place of the yacht and motor car, affording grand opportunities for the mountaineer and explorer, if the latter could find anything new to explore. Then there will also be a direct route to the North Pole over the top of those terrible ice fields that have cost civilization so many gallant lives. And possibly the ease of transit will bring the nations closer together and produce good fellowship and concord among them. It is pleasanter to regard the flying machine of the future as a bringer of peace than as a novel means of spreading death and destruction. End of chapter 19 Mechanical Flight Recording by Alistair Braid, Glasgow, Scotland Chapter 20 of The Romance of Modern Invention This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams Chapter 20 Typesetting by Machinery to the Assyrian brickmakers, who, thousands of years ago, used blocks wherewith to impress on their unbaked bricks hieroglyphics and symbolical characters, must be attributed the first hesitating step towards that most marvellous and revolutionary of human discoveries, the art of printing. Not, however, till the early part of the fifteenth century did gutenberg and costa conceive the brilliant but simple idea of printing from separate types which could be set in different orders and combinations to represent different ideas for englishmen fourteen seventy four deserves to rank with eighteen fifteen as in that year a very Waterloo was won on English soil against the forces of ignorance and oppression, though the effects of the victory were not at once evident. Considering the stir made at the time by the appearance of Caxton's first book at Westminster, it seems strange that an invention of such importance as the printing press should have been frowned upon by those in power and so discouraged that for nearly two centuries printing remained an ill-used and unprogressive art a giant half strangled in his cradle yet as soon as prejudice gave it an open field improved methods followed close on one another's heels today we have in the place of caxton's rude handmade press great cylinder machines capable of absorbing paper by the mile and grinding out twenty thousand impressions an hour as easily as a child can unwind a reel of cotton side by side with the problem how to produce the greatest possible number of copies in a given time from one machine has arisen another how to set up type with a proportionate rapidity a press without type is as useless as a chaff cutter without hay or straw the type once assembled as many casts or stereotypes can be made from it as there are machines to be worked 
but to arrange a large body of type in a short time brings the printer face to face with the need of employing the expensive services of a small army of compositors unless he can attain his end by some equally efficient and less costly means for the last century a struggle has been in progress between the machine compositor and the human compositor mechanical ingenuity against eye and brains in the last five years the battle has turned most decidedly in favour of the machine today there are in existence two wonderful contrivances which enable a man to set up type six times as fast as he could by hand from a box of type with an ease that reminds one of the mythical machine for the conversion of live pigs into strings of sausages by an uninterrupted series of movements these machines are called respectively the linotype and monotype roughly described they are to the compositor what a typewriter is to a clerk forming words in obedience to the depression of keys on a keyboard but whereas the typewriter merely imprints a single character on paper the linotype and monotype cast deliver and set up type from which an indefinite number of impressions can be taken they meet the compositor more than half way and simplify his labour while hugely increasing his productiveness as far back as eighteen forty two periodicals were mechanically composed by a machine which is now practically forgotten since that time hundreds of other inventions have been patented and some scores of different machines tried though with small success in most cases as it was found that quality of composition was sacrificed to quantity and that what at first appeared a short cut to the printing press was after all the longest way round when corrections had all been attended to a really economical typesetter must be accurate as well as prolific slipshod work will not pay in the long run such a machine was perfected a few years ago by ottmar mergenthaler of baltimore who devised the plan of casting a whole line of type the linotype composing machine to give it its full title produces type all ready for the presses in slugs or lines hence the name lin o type it deserves at least a short description the linotype occupies about six square feet of floor space weighs one ton and is entirely operated by one man its most prominent features are a sloping magazine at the top to hold the brass matrices or dies from which the type is cast a keyboard controlling the machinery to drop and collect the dies and a long lever which restores the dies to the magazine when done with the operator sits facing the keyboard in which are ninety keys variously coloured to distinguish the different kinds of letters his hands twinkle over the keys and the brass dies fly into place when a key is depressed a die shoots from the magazine onto a travelling belt and is whirled off to the assembling box each die is a flat oblong brass plate of a thickness varying with the letter having a large v-shaped notch in the top and the letter cut halfway down on one side of the longer sides a corresponding letter is stamped on the side nearest to the operator so that he may see what he is doing and make needful corrections as soon as a word is complete he touches the spacing lever at the side of the keyboard the action causes a space to be placed against the last die to separate it from the following word the operations are repeated until the tinkle of a bell warns him that 
though there may be room for one or two more letters the line will not admit another whole syllable the line must therefore be justified that is the spaces between the words increase till the vacant room is filled in in hand composition this takes a considerable time and is irksome but at the linotype the operator merely twists a handle and the wedge-shaped spaces placed thin end upwards are driven up simultaneously giving the lateral expansion required to make the line of the right measure a word about the spaces or space bands were each a single wedge the pressure would be on the bottom only of the dies and their tops being able to move slightly would admit lead between them to obviate this a small second wedge thin end downwards is arranged to slide on the larger wedge so that in all positions parallelism is secured this smaller wedge is of the same shape as the dies and remains stationary in line with them the larger one only moving the line of dies being now complete it is automatically borne off and pressed into contact with the casting wheel this wheel revolving on its centre has a slit in it corresponding in length and width to the size of line required at first the slit is horizontal and the dies fit against it so that the row of sunk letters on the faces are in the exact position to receive the molten lead which is squirted through the slit from behind by an automatic pump supplied from a metal pot the pot is kept at a proper heat of five hundred and fifty degrees fahrenheit by the flames of a bunsen burner the lead solidifies in an instant and the slug of type is ready for removal after its back has been carefully trimmed by a knife the wheel revolves for a quarter turn bringing the slit into a vertical position a punch drives out the slug which is slid into the galley to join its predecessors the wheel then resumes its former horizontal position in readiness for another cast the assembled dies have for the time done their work and must be returned to the magazine the mechanism used to effect this is peculiarly ingenious an arm carrying a ribbed bar descends the dies are pushed up leaving the spacers behind to be restored to their proper compartment till on a level with the ribbed bar onto which they are slid by a lateral movement the notches of the v-shaped opening in the top side of each die engaging with the ribs on the bar the bar then ascends till it is in line with a longer bar of like section passing over the open top of the entire magazine a set of horizontal screw bars rotating at high speed transfer the dies from the short to the long bar along which they move till as a die comes above its proper division of the magazine the arrangement of the teeth allows it to drop while all this has been going on the operator has composed another line of moulds which will in turn be transferred to the casting wheel and then back to the magazine so that the three operations of composing casting and sorting moulds are in progress simultaneously in different parts of the machine with the result that as many as twenty thousand letters can be formed by an expert in the space of an hour against the fifteen hundred letters of a skilled hand compositor how about corrections even a comma too few or too many needs the whole line cast over again it is a convincing proof of the difference in speed between the two methods that a column of type can be corrected much faster by the machine handicapped as it is by its solid slugs than by hand no wonder then that more than one thousand linotypes are to be found in the printing offices of great britain 
the monotype like the linotype aims at speed in composition but in its mechanism it differs essentially from the linotype in the first place the apparatus is constructed in two quite separate parts there is a keyboard which may be on the third floor of the printing offices and the casting machine which ceaselessly casts and sets type in the basement yet they are but one whole the connecting link is the long strip of paper punched by the keyboard mechanism and then transferred to the casting machine to bring about the formation of type the keyboard is the servant of man the casting machine is the slave of the keyboard secondly the monotype casts type not in blocks or a whole line but in separate letters it is thus a complete type foundry order it to cast g's and it will turn them out by the thousand till another letter is required thirdly by means of the punch paper roll the same type can be set up time after time without a second recourse to the keyboard just as a tune is ground repeatedly out of a barrel organ the keyboard has a formidable appearance it contains two hundred and twenty-five keys providing as many characters also thirty keys to regulate the spacing of the words at the back of the machine a roll of paper runs over rollers and above a row of thirty little punches worked by the keys a key being depressed an opened valve admits air into two cylinders each driving a punch the punches fly up and cut two neat little holes in the paper the roll then moves forward for the next letter at the end of the word a special lever is used to register a space and so on to the end of the line the operator then consults an automatic indicator which tells him exactly how much space is left and how much too long or too short the line would be if the spaces were of the normal size supposing for instance that there are ten spaces and that there is one tenth of an inch to spare it is obvious that by extending each space one hundredth of an inch the vacant room will be exactly filled similarly if the ten normal spaces would make the line one tenth of an inch too long by decreasing the spaces each one hundredth inch the line will also be justified but the operator need not trouble his head about calculations of this kind his indicator a vertical cylinder covered with tiny squares in each of which are printed two figures tell him exactly what he has to do on pressing a certain key the cylinder revolves and comes to rest with the tip of a pointer over a square the operator at once presses down the keys bearing the numbers printed on that square confident that the line will be of the proper length as soon as the roll is finished it is detached from the keyboard and introduced to the casting machine hitherto passive it now becomes active having been placed in position on the rollers it is slowly unwound by the machinery the paper passes over a hollow bar in which there are as many holes as there were punches in the keyboard and in precisely the same position when a hole in the paper comes over a hole in the hollow bar air rushes in and passing through a tube actuates the typesetting machinery in a certain manner so as to bring the desired die into contact with molten lead the dies are in the monotype all carried in a magazine about three inches square which moves backwards or forwards to right or left in obedience to orders from the perforated roll the dies are arranged in exactly the same way as the keys on the keyboard so that supposing a to have been stamped on the roll 
one of the perforations causes the magazine to slide one way while the other shoves it another until the combined motions bring the matrix engraved with the a underneath the small hole through which molten lead is forced the letter is ejected and moves sideways through a narrow channel pushing preceding letters before it and the magazine is free for other movements at the end of each word a space or blank lead is cast its size exactly determined by the justifying hole belonging to that line word follows word till the line is complete then a knife-like lever rises and the type is propelled into the galley though a slave the casting machine will not tolerate injustice needles hotel to swan should the compositor have made a mistake so that the line is too long or too short automatic machinery at once comes into play and slips the driving belt from the fixed to the loose pulley thus stopping the machine till someone can attend to it but if the punching has been correctly done the machine will work away unattended till a whole column of type having been set up it comes to a standstill the advantages of the monotype are easily seen in order to save money a man need not possess the complete apparatus if he has the keyboard only he becomes to a certain extent his own compositor able to set up the type as it were by proxy at any convenient time he can give his undivided attention to the keyboard stop work whenever he likes without keeping a casting machine idle and as soon as his role is complete forward it to a central establishment where type is set there a single man can superintend the completion of half a dozen men's labours at the keyboard that means a great reduction of expense in due time he receives back his copy in the shape of set-up type all ready to be corrected and transferred to the printing machines the type done with he can melt it down without fear of future regret for he knows that the paper roll locked up in his cupboard will do its work a second time as well as it did the first should he need the same matter resetting he has only to send the roll through the post to the central establishment thanks to mr lanston's invention we may hope for the day when every parish will be able to do its own printing or at least set up its own magazine the only thing needful will be a monotype keyboard supplied by an enlightened parish council as soon as the expense appears justifiable and kept in the post office or village institute the payment of a small fee will entitle the squire to punch out his speech on behalf of the conservative candidate the schoolmaster to compose special information for his pupils the rector to reduce to print pamphlets and appeals to charity and if those of humbler degree think they can strike eloquence from the keys they too will of course be allowed to turn out their ideas literally by the yard End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the romance of modern invention this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams. Chapter 21. Photography in Colors. While photography was still in its infancy, many people believed that a means having been found of impressing the representation of an object on a sensitized surface a short time only would have to elapse before the discovery of some method of registering the colors as well as the forms of nature 
photography has during the last 40 years passed through some startling developments, especially as regards speed. Experts such as Monsieur Murray have proved the superiority of the camera over the human eye in its power to grasp the various phases of animal motion. Even rifle bullets have been arrested in their lightning flight by the sensitized plate. But while the camera is a valuable aid to the eye in the matter of form, the eye still has the advantage so far as color is concerned. It is still impossible for a photographer, by a simple process similar to that of making an ordinary black and white negative, to affect a plate in such a manner that from it prints may be made by a single operation showing objects in their natural colors. Nor, for that matter, does color photography direct from nature seem any nearer attainment now than it was in the time of Daguerre. There are, however, extant several methods of making color photographs in an indirect or roundabout way. These various dodges are, apart from their beautiful results, so extremely ingenious and interesting that we propose here to examine three of the best known. The reader must be careful to banish from his mind those colored photographs so often seen in railway carriages and shop windows, which are purely the result of handwork and mechanical printing, and therefore not color photographs at all. Before embarking on an explanation of these three methods, it will be necessary to examine briefly the nature of those phenomena on which all are based, light and color. The two are really identical. Light is color, and color is light. Scientists now agree that the sensation of light arises from the wave-like movements of that mysterious fluid, the omnipresent ether. In a beam of white light, several rates of wave vibrations exist side by side. Pass the beam through a prism, and the various rapidities are sorted out into violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red, which are called the pure colors, since if any of them be passed again through a prism, the result is still that color, crimson, brown, etc. The composite colors would, if subjected to the prism, at once split up into their component pure colors. There are several points to be noticed about the relationship of the seven pure colors. In the first place, though they are all allies in the task of making white light, there is hostility among them, each being jealous of the others, and only waiting for a chance to show it. Thus, suppose that we have on a strip of paper squares of the seven colors, and look at the strip through a piece of red glass. We see only one square, the red, in its natural color since that square is in harmony only with red rays. Compare the sympathy of a piano with a note struck on another instrument. If C is struck, say on a violin, the piano strings producing the corresponding note will sound, but the other strings will be silent. The orange square suggests orange, but the green and blue and violet appear black. Red glass has a rested their ether vibrations, and said, no way here. Green and violet would serve just the same trick on red or on each other. It is from this readiness to absorb or stop dissimilar rays that we have the different colors in a landscape flooded by a common white sunlight. The trees and grass absorb all but the green rays which they reflect. The dandelions and buttercups capture and hold fast all but the yellow rays. The poppies in the corn send us back red only, and the cornflowers only blue. But the daisy is more generous and gives up all the seven. Color, therefore, is not a thing that can be touched any more than the sound, but merely the capacity to affect the retina of the eye with a certain number of ether vibrations per second and it makes no difference whether light is reflected from a substance or refracted through a substance. A red brick 
and a piece of red glass have similar effects on the eye. This, then, is the first thing to be clearly grasped, that whenever a color has a chance to make prisoners of other colors, it will do so. The second point is rather more intricate, that this imprisonment is going on even when the friendly concord appears to be the order of the day. Let us endeavor to present this clearly to the reader. Of the pure colors, violet, green, and red, the extremes and the center are sufficient to produce white, because each contains an element of its neighbors. Violet has a certain amount of indigo, green, some yellow, red, some orange. In fact, every color of the spectrum contains a greater or less degree of several of the others, but not enough to destroy its own identity. Now suppose that we have three lanterns projecting their rays onto the same portion of a white sheet, and that in front of the first is placed a violet glass, in front of the second a green glass, in front of the third a red glass. What is the result? White light. Why? Because they meet on equal terms, as no one of them is at a point of advantage. No prisoners can be made, and they must work in harmony. Next, turn down the violet lantern, and green and red produce a yellow, halfway between them. Turn down red and turn up violet, indigo blue results. All the way through, a compromise is effected. But supposing that the red and green glasses are put in front of the same lantern, and the white light sent through them, where has the yellow gone to? Only a brownish-black light reaches the screen. The same thing happens with red and violet, or green and violet. Prisoners have been taken because one color has had to demand passage from the other. Red says to green, You want your rays to pass through me, but they shall not. Green retorts, Very well, but I myself have already cut off all but green rays, and if they don't pass you, nothing shall. And the consequence of the quarrel is practical darkness. The same phenomenon may be illustrated with blue and yellow. Lights of these two colors projected simultaneously onto a sheet yield white, but the white light sent through the blue and yellow grass in succession produces green light. Also, blue paint mixed with yellow gives green. In neither case is there darkness or entire cutting off of color as in the case of red plus violet, or green plus red. The reason is easy to see. Blue light is a compromise of violet and green, yellow of green and red. Hence, the two colored lights falling on the screen make a combination which can be expressed as an addition sum. Blue equals green plus violet. Yellow equals green plus red. Therefore, green plus violet plus red equals white. But when light is passed through two colored glasses in succession, or reflected from two layers of colored paints, there are prisoners to be made. Blue passes green and violet only. Yellow passes green and red only. So violet is captured by yellow and red by blue, green being free to pass on its way. There is then a great difference between the mixing of colors, which evokes any tendency to antagonism, and the adding of colors under such conditions that they meet on equal terms. The first process happens, as we have seen, when a ray of light is passed through colors in succession. The second, when lights stream simultaneously onto an object. A white screen, being capable of reflecting any color that falls onto it, will, with equal readiness, show green, red, violet, or a combination. But a substance that is in white light red, green, or violet, will capture any other color. So that, if for the white screen we substituted a red one, violet or green falling simultaneously would yield blackness because red takes both prisoners. If it were violet, green would be captured, and so on. 
From this follows another phenomenon, that whereas projection of two or more lights may yield white, white cannot result from any mixture of pigments. A person with a whole box full of paints could not get white were he to mix them in an infinitude of different ways, but with the aid of his lanterns and as many differently colored glasses, the feat is easy enough. Any two colors which meet on equal terms to make white are called complementary colors. Thus yellow equals red plus green lights is the complementary of violet. Thus pink equals red plus violet lights is the complementary of green. Thus blue equals violet plus green lights is the complementary of red. This does not, of course, apply to mixture of paints, for complementary colors must act together, not in antagonism. If the reader has mastered these preliminary considerations, he will have no difficulty in following out the following processes. A. The Jolly process, invented by Professor Jolly of Dublin. A glass plate is ruled across with fine parallel lines. 350 to the inch, we believe. These lines are filled in alternately with violet, green, and red matter, every third being violet, green, or red, as the case may be. The color screen is placed in the camera in front of the sensitized plate. Upon exposure being made, all light reflected from a red object to select a color is allowed to pass through the red lines, but blocked by all the green and violet lines, so that on development that part of the negative corresponding to the position of the red object will be covered with these dark lines separated by transparent belts of twice the breadth. From the negative, a positive is printed, which of course shows transparent lines separated by opaque belts of twice their breadth. Now suppose we take the color screen and place it again in front of the plate in the position it occupied when the negative was taken. The red lines being opposite the transparent parts of the positive will be visible, but the green and violet being blocked by the black deposit behind them will not be noticeable, so that the object is represented by a number of red lines which at a small distance appear to blend into a continuous whole. The violet and green affect the plate in corresponding manner, and composite colors will affect two sets of lines in varying degrees, the lines from the two sets blending in the eye. Thus yellow will obtain passage from both green and red, and when the screen is held up against the positive, the light streaming through the green and red lines will blend into yellow in the same manner as they would make yellow if projected by lanterns onto a screen. The same applies to all the colors. The advantage of the Jolly process is that in it only one negative has to be made. B. The Ives process. Mr. Frederick Eugene Ives of Philadelphia arrives at the same result as Professor Jolly, but by an entirely different means. He takes three negatives of the same object, one through a violet blue, another through a green, and a third through a red screen placed in front of the lens. The red negative is affected by red rays only, the green by green rays only, and the violet blue by violet blue rays only, in the proper gradations. That is to say, each negative will have opaque patches wherever the rays of a certain kind strike it, and the positive printed off will be by consequence transparent at the same places. By holding the positive made from the red screen negative against a piece of red glass, we should see light only in those parts of the positive which were transparent. Similarly with the green and violet positives, if viewed through glasses of the proper color, the most ingenious part of Mr. Ives' method is the apparatus for presenting all three positives lighted through their colored glasses to the eye simultaneously. 
when properly adjusted so that their various parts exactly coincide the eye blends the three together seeing green red or violet separately or blended in correct proportions the chromoscope as the viewing apparatus is termed contains three mirrors projecting the reflections from the positives in a single line as the three slides are taken stereoscopically the result gives the impression of solidity as well as of color and is most realistic c the sanger shepherd process this is employed mostly for lantern transparencies as in the ives process three negatives and three transparent positives are made but instead of colored glasses being used to give effect to the positives the positives themselves are dyed and placed one on top of another in close contact so that the light from the lantern passes through them in succession we have therefore now quitted the realms of harmony for that of discord in which prisoners are made and mr shepherd has had to arrange matters that in every case the capture of prisoners does not interfere with the final result but conduces to it in the first place three negatives are secured through violet green and red screens positives are printed by the carbon process on thin celluloid films the carbon films contains gelatin and brichomate of potassium the light acts on the brichomate in such a way as to render the gelatin insoluble the result is that though in the positives there is at first no color patches of gelatin are left which will absorb dyes of various colors the dyeing process requires a large amount of care and patience now it would be a mistake to suppose that each positive is dyed in the color of the screen through which its negative was taken a moment's consideration will show us why let us assume that we are photographing a red object a flower pot for instance the red negative represents the pot by a dark deposit the positive printed off will consequently show clear glass at that spot the unaffected gelatin being soluble so that to dye that plate would be to make all red except for the very part which we require red and on holding it up to the light the flower pot would appear as a white transparent patch how then is the problem solved mr shepherd's process is based on an ordered system of prisoner taking thus as red in this particular case is wanted it will be attained by the other two positives which are placed in contact with the red positive so that all three coincide exactly robbing white light of all but its red rays now if the other positives were dyed green and violet what would happen they would not produce red but by robbing white light between them of red green and violet would produce blackness they would not produce red but by robbing the white light between them of red green and violet would produce blackness and we should be as far as ever from our object the positives are therefore dyed not in the same colors as the screens used when the negatives were made but in their complementary colors that is as explained above those colors which added to the color of the screen would make white the red screen negative is therefore dyed violet plus green equals blue the green negative red plus violet equals pink the violet negative red plus green equals yellow to return to our flower pot the red screen positive dyed blue is as we saw quite transparent where the pot should be but behind the transparent gap are the pink and yellow positives white light equals violet plus green plus red passes through the pink equals violet plus red and has to surrender all its green rays the violet and red pass on and encounter yellow equals green plus red and violet falls a victim to green leaving red unmolested if the flower pot had been white 
all three positives would have contained clear patches unaffected by the three dyes, and the white light would have been unobstructed. The gradations and mixtures of colors are obtained by two of the screens being influenced by the color of the object. Thus, if it were crimson, both violet and red screen negatives would be affected by the rays reflected by it, and the green screen negative not at all. Hence, the pink positive would be pink, the yellow clear, and the blue clear. White light passing through is robbed by pink of green, leaving red plus violet equals crimson. Color printing. Printing in ink colors is done in a manner very similar to the Sanger Shepherd lantern slide process. Three blocks are made by the help of photography through violet, green, and red screens and etched away with acid like ordinary half-tone black and white blocks. The three blocks have applied to them ink of a complementary color to the screen they represent just as in the Sanger Shepherd process, the positives were dyed. The three inks are laid over one another on the paper by the blocks, the relieved parts of which corresponding to the undissolved gelatin of the Shepherd positives only take the ink. White light being reflected through layers of colored inks is treated in just the same way as it would be were it transmitted through colored glasses yielding all the colors in approximately correct gradations. End of chapter 21, Photography in Colors. Recording by Tom Mack. Chapter 22 of The Romance of Modern Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams. Lighting. The production of fire by artificial means has been reasonably regarded as the greatest invention in the history of the human race. Prior to the day when a man was first able to call heat from the substances about him, the condition of our ancestors must have been wretched indeed. Raw food was their portion. Metals mingled with other matter mocked their efforts to separate them. The cold of winter drove them to the recesses of gloomy caverns, where night reigned perpetual. The production of fire also, of course, entailed the creation of light, which in its developments has been of an importance second only to the improved methods of heating. So accustomed are we to our candles, our lamps, our gas jets, our electric lights, that it is hard for us to imagine what an immense effect their sudden and complete removal would have on our existence. At times, when floods, explosions, or other accidents cause a temporary stoppage of the gas or current supply, a town may for a time be plunged into darkness, but this only for a short period, the distress of which can be alleviated by recourse to paraffin lamps or the more homely candle. The earliest method of illumination was the rough and ready one of kindling a pile of brushwood or logs, the light produced was very uncertain and feeble, but possibly sufficient for the needs of the cave-dweller. With the advance of civilization arose an increasing necessity for a more steady illuminant, discovered in vegetable oils, burned in lamps of various designs. Lamps have been found in old Egyptian and Etruscan tombs constructed thousands of years ago. These lamps do not differ essentially from those in use today, being reservoirs fitted with a channel to carry a wick but probably from the difficulty of procuring oil lamps fell into comparative disuse or rather were almost unknown in many countries of europe as late as the fifteenth century when the cottage and baronial hall were alike lit by the blazing torch fixed into an iron sconce or bracket on the wall the rushlight consisting of a peeled rush coated by repeated dipping into a vessel of melted fat made a feeble effort to dispel the gloom of long winter evenings this was succeeded by the tallow and more scientifically made wax candle, which last still maintains a certain popularity. How our grandmothers managed to keep their eyes, as they worked at stitching by the light of a couple of candles, whose advent was the event of the evening, is now a mystery. Today we feel aggrieved if our lamps are not of many candle power, and protest that our sight will be ruined by what 150 years ago would have seemed a marvel of illumination. 
in the case of lighting necessity has been the mother of invention the tendency of modern life is to turn night into day we go to bed late and we get up late this is perhaps foolish but still we do it and what is more we make increasing use of places such as basements underground tunnels and tubes to which the light of heaven cannot penetrate during any of the daily twenty-four hours the nineteenth century saw a wonderful advance in the science of illumination as early as eighteen o four the famous scientist sir humphrey davy discovered the electric arc presently to be put to such universal use about the same time gas was first manufactured and led about in pipes but before electricity for lighting purposes had been rendered sufficiently cheap the discovery of the huge oil deposits in pennsylvania flooded the world with an inexpensive illuminant as early as the thirteenth century marco polo the explorer wrote of a natural petroleum spring at baku on the caspian sea there is a fountain of great abundance inasmuch as a thousand shiploads might be taken from it at one time this oil is not good to use with food but it is good to burn and is also used to anoint camels that have the manj. people come from vast distances to fetch it for in all other countries there is no oil his last words have been confuted by the american oil fields yielding many thousands of barrels a day often in such quantities that the oil runs to waste for lack of a buyer the rivals for pre-eminence in lighting today are electricity coal gas petroleum and acetylene gas the two former have the advantage of being easily turned on at will like water the third is more generally available the invention of the dynamo by graham in 1870 marks the beginning of an epoch in the history of illumination with its aid current of such intensity as to constantly bridge an air gap between carbon points could be generated for a fraction of the cost entailed by other previous methods paul jablokov devised in eighteen seventy six his electric candle a couple of parallel carbon rods separated by an insulating medium that wasted away under the influence of heat at the same rate as the rods the candles were used with rapidly alternating currents as the positive pole wasted twice as quickly as the negative during the paris exhibition of eighteen seventy eight visitors to paris were delighted by the new method of illumination installed in some of the principal streets and theatres the arc lamp of today such as we see in our streets factories and railway stations is a modification of mr jablokov's principle carbon rods are used but they are pointed toward each other the distance between their extremities being kept constant by ingenious mechanical contrivances arc lamps of all types labour under the disadvantage of being by necessity very powerful and were they only available the employment of electric lighting would be greatly restricted as it is we have thanks to the genius of mr edison a means of utilizing current in but small quantities to yield a gentler light the glow lamp as it is called is so familiar to us that we ought to know something of its antecedents in the arc lamp the electric circuit is broken at the point where light is required in glow or incandescent lamps the current is only hindered by the interposition of a bad conductor of electricity which must also be incombustible just as a current of water flows in less volume as the bore of a pipe is reduced and requires that greater pressure shall be exerted to force a constant amount through the pipe so is an electric current choked by its conductor being reduced in size or altered in nature edison in eighteen seventy eight employed as the current choker a very fine platinum wire which having a melting temperature of three thousand four hundred and fifty degrees fahrenheit allowed a very white heat to be generated in it the wire was enclosed in a glass bulb almost entirely exhausted of air by a mercury pump before being sealed but it was found that even platinum could not always withstand the heating effect of a strong current and accordingly edison looked about for some less combustible material mr j w swan of newcastle on tyne had already experimented with carbon filaments made from cotton threads steeped in sulphuric acid edison and swan joined hands to produce the present well-known lamp the ediswan the filament of which is a bamboo fibre carbonized during the exhaustion of air in the bulb to one millionth of an atmosphere pressure by passing the electric current through it these bamboo filaments are very elastic and capable of standing almost any heat glow lamps are made in all sizes from tiny globes small enough to top a tie pin to powerful lamps of a thousand candle power 
their independence of atmospheric air renders them most convenient in places where other forms of illumination would be dangerous or impossible for example in coal mines and under water during diving operations by their aid great improvements have been effected in the lighting of theatres which require a quick switching on and off of light they have also been used in connection with minute cameras to explore the recesses of the human body in libraries they illuminate without injuring the books in living rooms they do not foul the air or blacken the ceiling like oil or gas burners the advantages of the edison lamp are in short multitudinous cheapness of current to work them is of course a very important condition of their economy in some small country villages the cottages are lit by electricity even in england but these are generally within easy reach of water power mountainous districts such as norway and switzerland with their rushing streams and high waterfalls are peculiarly suited for electric lighting the cost of which is mainly represented by the expense of the generating apparatus and the motive power one of the greatest engineering undertakings in the world is connected with the manufacture of electric current niagara the thunder of the waters as the indians called it has been harnessed to produce electrical energy convertible at will into motion heat or light the falls pass all the water overflowing from nearly a hundred thousand square miles of lakes which in turn drain a far larger area of territory upwards of ten thousand cubic yards of water leap over the falls every second and are hurled downwards for more than two hundred feet with an energy of eight or nine million horsepower in eighteen eighty six a company determined to turn some of this huge force to account they bought up land on the american bank and cut a tunnel six thousand seven hundred yards long beginning a mile and a half above the falls and terminating below them water drawn from the river thunders into the tunnel through a number of wheel pits at the bottom of each of which is a water turbine developing five thousand horsepower the united force of the turbines is said to approximate one hundred thousand horsepower and as if this were but a small thing the same company has obtained concessions to erect plants on the canadian bank to double or treble the total power so cheaply is current thus produced that the company is in a position to supply it at rates which appear small compared with those that prevail in this country a farthing will there purchase what would here cost from nine pence to a shilling under such conditions the electric lamp need fear no competitor but in less favoured districts gas and petroleum are again holding up their heads both coal and oil gas develop a great amount of heat in proportion to the light they yield the hydrogen they contain in large quantities burns when pure with an almost invisible flame but more hotly than any other known gas the particles of carbon also present in the flame are heated to whiteness by the hydrogen but they are not sufficient in number to convert more than a fraction of the heat into light a german auer von lesbach conceived the idea of suspending round the flame a circular mantle of woven cotton steeped in a solution of certain rare earths for example lanthanum yttrium zirconium to arrest the heat and compel it to produce bright incandescence in the arresting substance with the same gas consumption a wellsback burner yields seven or more times the light of an ordinary batswing burner the light itself is also of a more pleasant description being well supplied with the blue rays of the spectrum the mantle is used with other systems than the ordinary gas jet recently two methods of illumination have been introduced in which the source of illumination is supplied under pressure the high pressure incandescent gas installations of mr william sugg supply gas to burners at five or six times the ordinary pressure of the mains the effect is to pulverize the gas as it issues from the nozzle of the burners and by rendering it more inflammable to increase its heating power until the surrounding mantle glows with a very brilliant and white light of great penetration gas is forced through the pipes connected with the lamps by hydraulic rams working gas pumps which alternately suck in and expel the gas under a pressure of twelve inches that is a pressure sufficient to maintain a column of water twelve inches high the gas under this pressure passes into a cylinder of a capacity considerably greater than the capacity of the pumps this cylinder neutralizes the shock of the rams when the stroke changes from up to down stroke and vice versa on the top of the cylinder is fixed a governor consisting of a strong leathern gas holder which has a stroke of about three inches and actuates a lever which opens and closes the valve through which the supply of water to the rams flows and reduces the flow of the water when it exceeds ten or twelve inches pressure according to circumstances 
the gas holder of the governor is lifted by the pressure of the gas in the cylinder which passes through a small opening from the cylinder to the governor so as not to cause any sudden rise or fall of the gas holder by this means a nearly constant pressure is maintained and from the outlet of the cylinder the gas passes to another governor sufficient to supply the number of lights the apparatus is designed for and to maintain the pressure without variation whether all or a few lamps are in action for very large installations steam is used each burner develops three hundred candle power a double cylinder steam engine working a double pump supplies three hundred of these burners giving a total lighting power of ninety thousand candles as compared with the cost of low pressure incandescent lighting the high pressure system is very economical being but half as expensive for the same amount of light it is largely used in factories and railway stations it may be seen on the tower bridge blackfriars bridge euston station and in the terminus of the great central railways st john's wood perhaps the most formidable rival to the electric arc lamp for the lighting of large spaces and buildings is the kitson oil lamp now so largely used in america and this country the lamp is usually placed on the top of an iron post similar to an ordinary gas light standard at the bottom of the post is a chamber containing a steel reservoir capable of holding from five to forty gallons of petroleum above the oil is an air space into which air has been forced at a pressure of fifty pounds to the square inch to act as an elastic cushion to press the oil into the burners the oil passes upwards through an extremely fine tube scarcely thicker than electric incandescent wires to a pair of cross tubes above the burners the top one of these acts as a filter to arrest any foreign matter that finds its way into the oil the lower one in diameter about the size of a lead pencil and eight inches long is immediately above the mantles the heat from which vaporizes the small quantity of oil in the tube the oil gas then passes through a tiny hole no larger than a needle point into an open mixing tube where sufficient air is drawn in for supporting combustion the mixture then travels down to the mantle inside which it burns an ingenious device has lately been added to the system for facilitating the lighting of the lamp at the base of the lamp post a small hermetically closed can containing petroleum ether is placed and connected by very fine copper tubing with a burner under the vaporizing tube when the lamp is to be lit a small rubber bulb is squeezed forcing a quantity of the ether vapor into the burner where it is ignited by a platinum wire rendered incandescent by a current passing from a small accumulator also placed in the lamp post the burner rapidly heats the vaporizing tube and in a few moments oil gas is passing into the mantles where it is ignited by the burner so economical is the system that a light of a thousand candle power is produced by the combustion of about half a pint of petroleum per hour comparisons are proverbially odious but in many cases very instructive professor v b lewes thus tabulates the results of experiments with various luminants cost of a thousand candles per hour electricity incandescent one shilling tuppence arc three and three quarters pence coal gas flat flame one shilling sixpence incandescent two and a quarter pence incandescent high pressure one three quarter pence oil lamp oil at eight pence per gallon seven and a quarter pence incandescent lamp two and a quarter pence kitson lamp one penny petroleum therefore at present comes in a very good first in england the system that we have noticed at some length has been adapted for lighthouse use as it gives a light peculiarly fog piercing it is said to approximate most closely to ordinary sunlight and on that account has been found very useful for the taking of photographs at night time the portability of the apparatus makes it popular with contractors and the fact that its installation requires no tearing up of the streets is a great recommendation with the long-suffering public of some of our large towns another very powerful light is produced by burning the gas given off by carbide of calcium when immersed in water acetylene gas as it is called is now widely used in cycle and motor lamps which emit a shaft of light sometimes painfully dazzling to those who have to face it in germany the gas is largely employed in village streets and in this country it is gaining ground as an illuminant of country houses being easy to manufacture in small gasometers of a few cubic yards capacity and economical to burn 
well supplied as we are with lights we find nevertheless that savants are constantly in pursuit of an ideal illuminant from the sun are borne to us through the ether light waves heat waves magnetic waves and other waves of which we have as yet but a dim perception the waves are commingled and we are unable to separate them absolutely and as soon as we try to copy the sun's effects as a source of heat or light we find the same difficulty the fire that cooks our food gives off a quantity of useless light waves the oil lamp that brightens one's rooms gives off a quantity of useless often obnoxious heat the ideal illuminant and the ideal heating agent must be one in which the required waves are in great majority unfortunately even with our most perfected methods the production of light is accompanied by the exertion of a disproportionate amount of wasted energy in the ordinary incandescent lamp to take an instance only five or six per cent of the energy put into it as electricity results in light the rest is dispelled in overcoming the resistance of the filament and agitating the few air molecules in the bulb to this we must add the fact that the current itself represents but a fraction of the power exerted to produce it the following words of professor lodge are to the point on this subject look at the furnaces and boilers of a steam engine driving a group of dynamos and estimate the energy expended and then look at the incandescent filaments of the lamps excited by them and estimate how much of their radiated energy is of real service to the eye it will be as the energy of a pitch pipe to an entire orchestra it is not too much to say that a boy turning a handle could if his energy were properly directed produce quite as much real light as is produced by all this mass of mechanisms and consumption of material professor oliver lodge in a lecture to the ismodian society third of june eighteen eighty nine the most perfect light in nature is probably that of the glow-worm and firefly a phosphorescent or cold light illuminating without combustion owing to the absence of all waves but those of the requisite frequency the task before mankind is to imitate the glow-worm in the production of isolated light waves the nearest approach to its achievement has occurred in the laboratories of mr nikola tesla the famous electrician by means of a special oscillator invented by himself he has succeeded in throwing the ether particles into such an intense state of vibration that they become luminous in other words he has created vibrations of the enormous rapidity of light and this without the creation of heat waves to any appreciable extent an incandescent lamp mounted on a powerful coil is lit without contact by ether waves transmitted from a cable running round the laboratory or bulbs and tubes containing highly rarefied gases are placed between two large plate terminals arranged on the end walls as soon as the bulbs are held in the path of the currents passing through the ether from plate to plate they become incandescent shining with a light which though weak is sufficiently strong to take photographs by with a long exposure tesla has also invented what he calls a sanitary light as he claims for it the germ-killing properties of sunshine the lamps are glass tubes several feet long bent into spirals or other convolutions and filled before sealing with a certain gas the ends of the glass tube are coated with metal and provided with hooks to connect the lamp with an electric current the gas becomes luminous under the influence of current but not strictly incandescent as there is very little heat engendered this means economy in use the lamps are said to be cheaply manufactured but as yet they are not on the market we shall hear more of them in the near future which will probably witness no more interesting development than that of lighting before closing this chapter a few words may be said about new heating methods gas stoves are becoming increasingly popular by reason of the ease with which they can be put in action and made to maintain an even temperature but the most up-to-date heating apparatus is undoubtedly electrical utensils of all sorts are fitted with very thin heating strips formed by the deposition of precious metals such as gold platinum etc on exceedingly thin mica sheets through which are passed powerful currents from the mains the resistance of the strip converts the electromotive energy of the current into heat which is either radiated into the air or into water for cookery etc in all parts of the house the electric current may be made to do work beside that of lighting it warms the passages by means of special radiators replacing the clumsy coal and stuffy gas stove in the kitchen it boils stews and fries heats the flat irons and ovens in the breakfast room boils the kettle keeps the dishes teapots and coffee pots warm in the bathroom heats the water in the smoking room replaces matches in the bedroom electrifies foot warmers and last wonder of all 
even makes possible an artificially warm bed quilt to heat the chilled limbs of invalids the great advantage of electric heating is the freedom from all smell and smoke that accompanies it but until current can be provided at cheaper rates than prevail at present its employment will be chiefly restricted to the houses of the wealthy or to large establishments such as hotels where it can be used on a sufficient scale to be comparatively economical end of chapter twenty two recording by phone end of the romance of modern invention by archibald williams